Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night. 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to get to introduce to you Ted Simpson. He's with the Wisconsin Maple Syrup Producers Association. He was born in Rice Lake, and as he explained to me, he wasn't born actually in the lake, but <laughs> in the that was his joke. It's good. I went to Bruce High School up in Rusk County and then studied math and computer science at UW River Falls. I got a Master's degree in education at UW Stout, and he taught at UW Barron uh, in computer science and wrote several textbooks in engineering and computer science. The reason he's here tonight, though, is his family, particularly his grandfather, started sugaring in the 1920s. I think this is going to be one of the more interesting and tasty, perhaps tasteful, talks we've had in a long time. I look forward to hearing what Ted has to tell us about the sweet story of Wisconsin maple syrup production. Please join me in welcoming Ted Simpson to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Oh, <clears throat> didn't want to turn it on too early to hear, hear all my <laughs> swallowing. Uh, so as, as Tom explained, I've been making the maple syrup uh, ever since I can remember uh, at, at my family's farm. Currently, my brother and I uh, own the Rocky Ridge Sugar Bush, started by our grandfather in the 1920s. It's located out of Rice Lake, uh, Wisconsin. There's Rice Lake and Highway C goes up into the Blue Hills. So we're up in the hills there, out of Rice Lake. And um, so my brother does a lot of the operation now, but I'm still involved. And uh, we have a little website. If at any point you'd like to check out some of our little videos and things we put out there. But really, the star of the show, well, maybe Tom, <laughs> but I think <laughs> in, it, it's the amazing maple tree, Acer Sacrum. There's like 148 varieties of this tree throughout the world. And it, interesting that the Sacrum family also includes sugar canes. So uh, maybe it's not surprising that sugar comes from these trees as well. It has a very unique uh, sap flow developed mechanism. A tree like the one shown in the picture here, it's not uncommon to have like 20 gallons of sap from this tree, and it can vary a lot by season. Uh, they live up to 400 years. We haven't noticed any real decline in their life as a result of tapping them. So that doesn't seem to affect them. They've had them in Vermont, they've tapped them for hundreds of years, and they're still tapping them. So. Uh, you know, they have a height of around 120 feet, and, and they can get these, a tremendous crown. That's why they call them sometimes a sugar bush, because a tree will bush out if, it, if it's in the open. And, and all those leaves, of course, are all, you know, carbohydrate generators, right? So the more bushy leaves we have, the, the more sap production capability. That tree, as you can see, that one is a real bushy, big maple in the picture. You know, they, they live as little saplings down on the forest floor. For, for years when you can see the other, the oaks, the ash, the, the popple. But eventually those trees fall or bit blowing down or cut down and then these maples come up and become the predominant tree of the forest as well as the white pine. While there's 140 some varieties of maple, we're really interested in just a few but maple trees that are actually used in commercial production. The sugar, or hard maple, sometimes very similar relative of it is the black maple. And these have the best sugar content and the most quantity of sap. And they're a hard wood. You oftentimes when you see uh, furniture made of maple, oftentimes it's the hard maple that, that it's made from because it's a hard, durable wood. When we cook that sap, it tends to create a lighter, more delicately flavored syrup. We don't have as many black maple in Wisconsin. They tend to be a little bit further south and, and um, to the west some. The red maple, also quite common in many of our forests, but it has some less sugar content in the sap, being around 2%, let's say. And, and it typically has less reliable sap flow with um, a smaller volume. So while a lot of sugar uh, producers tap red maple, it, it, it's not the preferred tree, but if it's there, 
and it's handy, I'll hang a pail on it or hook a tube on it. We've got to be careful, though, because they tend to bud earlier. And once the buds come out, then you don't get a good flavored maple syrup. It's called buddy syrup. So if you have a lot of red maples in your sugar bush, you've got to be careful that you don't take that sap after the buds have matured or, or it'll, off, it'll, it'll, it'll taint your syrup flavor. Silver maple, very similar to red. You're more likely to find those in, in town and as shade trees and so forth. You probably have them in your yard. Well, I know we've got some in our yard because they grow fast and they have a nice top. Interesting, the box elder tree can also be used because it's actually a relative of the maple. And you can make box elder syrup. But it, it's not really maple syrup, a whole different kind of flavor. And, and it tends to be darker and again, the, ta the sap is not as sweet. One of the challenges we have is identifying the maples, especially in the winter when there's no leaves. I mean, when you can see the leaf, you're pretty familiar with what the maple leaf looks like. But what about when we're out here tapping? We've got to go by the bark. The hard maple has a rougher, a scalier bark. And the top you know, tends to be a little more delicate in terms of its limbs. The soft maples and red maples and silver maples tend to have more of a smooth bark. Sometimes it actually peels some because they grow quite fast. So it, it's a little bit of a challenge at first, but you get to know your trees kind of like recognizing people. And uh, at first, early, you know, beginning sugar makers, it's not uncommon for them to think, well, this tree hasn't run any sap, what's wrong? And you come in, well, that's an oak tree. No wonder it's not running any sap. You know, it's an ash tree. It's not a maple tree at all. Sometimes they, they can fool you, but you get to know your trees. Um, the, the hard maple particularly has this range a northeast U.S. and southern Canada, Quebec, and Ontario, principally. You can see we're located out here near the western end. Up here in Minnesota is kind of the, oops, I wasn't supposed to do that. They were going to tape this thing shut, so I couldn't. But OK, and it goes down to Iowa and then into Missouri. So the, the maple, that's the maple belt. That's where we make the maple syrup for the most part. They like a variety of soils, clay, loam, sandy, rocky soils, they're all good. But the maple does better if the soil is loose and not compacted. So you don't want to like pasture your sugar bush. Oh, that used to be done. Because it, it packs down that top soil and most of the maple's roots are near the top. So that really affects the amount of moisture and nutrients a tree can get. The, the maple likes well-drained soils for the most part and they can tolerate moderate drought. The soft maples, like the silver and the red, can handle more water and they, they can have their feet wet. But the hard maple doesn't like to have wet feet. So if it's in a swampy area, it probably isn't going to do very well. And they have poor salt tolerance. So having a maple tree along the highway where they do a lot of salting is not going to be probably as good for it. Um, okay, now we've told you about the tree. So what is maple syrup then? Well, for many people, Probably not Wisconsinite so much. But for many people, it's a sweet golden brown uh, sweetener we put on pancakes, waffles, and French toast. However, many people are mistaken in terms of thinking that flavor they get out of the uh, other syrups is maple. It's actually a, a, a fake maple or like mapleine or some other artificial flavor. It's not the real thing. So and pure maple syrup, the flavor is derived basically by cooking that sap. And during that heating and cooking process is where the flavor is generated. Uh, maple sap is a really interesting product in itself because it's a natural mixture of sugars, of course, water, it has minerals, and a whole organic brew of amino acids and other compounds. And when you cook that, those things combine to create that flavor. And that flavor will change a little bit from, from uh, sugar bush to sugar bush as well as throughout the year. We'll talk some more about that. And of course, a little warning to beware of, of, of what we call the fake maple syrups, uh, because one of the things that our association is trying to do is work with the international associations to make sure labeling is correct. So that these big companies aren't putting something like maple or have a picture of somebody collecting sap and there's nothing maple in it. <laughs> so we're trying to try to get that out of there. So maple syrup's flavor then comes from this cooking process. And, and part of that is the, the minerals and so forth found in the soil, the toit, the French call it in terms of a wine you know, vineyard. And just like with maple, so depending on where the maple tree is growing, it'll have a slightly different flavor to the maple syrup. 
And it also varies by season and uh, even by year, depending on the, 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 the season that we're having our flavor just be a little bit different. Uh, if you were just to take the water out of the sap, didn't cook it, you'd have a very sweet, clear liquid, but you wouldn't recognize it as maple syrup. So we've got to cook that to make that flavor. And speaking of flavor, today we have a new grading system, and, and if you're used to buying maple syrup, you might uh, wonder why they changed the name of it. It used to be called light amber, now it's called golden. It used to be called grade B, now it's called very dark. So this is the new international grading system that's being used throughout the U.S. and Canada today. Prior to this, states and Canada might use different names, but they wanted to grade everything and have a common name, so they finally came up with this. So golden is, is your real light. It has greater than 75% light transmittance, and you'll see some of the products up here are that way. Amber is a rich, a little bit darker syrup. It has more of a smooth, uh, caramelized flavor. Dark, we call it robust. I call it a balk of maple. Um, so it has that stronger flavor. But a lot of people really like that. When we have people sample syrup at our booth at the, at the fair or, or wherever, we find that half or more of the people like that dark flavor as compared to that really light, delicate flavor, sweet flavor. And then we have the very dark, which is our grade B, traditionally used more for cooking and baking and flavoring foods. Here you see some examples of the different uh, grades. Lighter grades typically come earlier in the season, and it has to do with the sap chemistry. It isn't like we're doing anything different. If we just do the same thing, early in the season we're going to get those golden ambers, and later in the season we're going to get those darks, and eventually very dark. Because the little enzymes and microbes are changing the sugar chemistry slightly and breaking down the sucrose into what we call invert sugars. So here's one of our favorite questions. Is maple syrup healthier? Yeah, say it. it didn't, I think I was going to say. <laughs> didn't come here for nothing. Um, okay, so it's, according to most studies, it is. And, 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 but, but, you know, why is this true? Well, according to a November 13th, if you have Time magazine, you might have seen the article on how maple is taking over pumpkin spice as, as uh, one of the uh, upcoming flavors. See? And they said in there that, that maple syrup contained over 40 antioxidants along with minerals and other organic compounds, and that it's actually lower in calories than other sweeteners for the same volume. Actually, <laughs> our association says there's 54 of these uh, compounds been identified in, in, in studies done in, in Canada and by Proctor University in Vermont. <clears throat> but still, okay, sugar is sugar, isn't it? I mean, what's the deal here? Oops. Okay, so I got uh, carried away with my little uh, study. I'm not a chemist, but I, you know, had a little fun with this. I, when, when you get a, a fruit from a tree or sap from the tree, it's primarily a sucrose sugar that, we're, that is coming from that uh, plant organism as it, as it, um, you know, as it is in the, in the wild. So we then take the apple and eat it. And the sucrose is broken down by our bodies into the fructose and glucose. Glucose is the blood sugar. It's the energy source that our body needs. And it is what is absorbed by muscles, and as I understand it, um, you know the the um, you know that's kind of the sugar you'll you'll when you measure uh, if you're diabetic you measure your blood sugar it's, it's the glucose you're measuring. The fructose, on the other hand, is processed differently, and it it's not as good for us. Some people say it, it has more it creates more fat in the livers, and and just generally speaking, fructose is not beneficial to our bodies. Well. So I put the little guy up there, high fructose sugar, which is corn syrup, right? <laughs> I mean, it's got a lot of fructose and, and very little glucose. So when it comes to sugars, then we, we rather have more of the glucose sugars and less of the fructose, and, and that's what we get with maple. So the sugar quality is better for our bodies and has all these other neat antioxidants and, and minerals and organic compounds in it. Here, this, I thought this chart was kind of cool. And now I'm going to go through all this, but look at it. Uh, Something like 
manganese to 95 in maple syrup, and look at the rest. I mean, it just blows everything else out of the water. And then calories, I guess white sugar is less, interestingly enough. Um, I think that's because of, of the glucose. But anyway, we actually have less calories. It's very similar to brown sugar, as you can see. OK, we take this information, and the maple syrup industry then is going to use that to help market our products. But before we get into that, who, a couple of questions that typically come up. Who discovered maple syrup? Probably you guys know that one. How was it used? And where does Wisconsin stand in the production of maple syrup? And a little bit about the roots of Wisconsin's production. So as we saw earlier, maple syrup is unique to North America and Canada. No Chinese import options here. They can't make it over there. They don't, they don't get the weather. They don't have the maple trees. Originally, this was the main source of sugar for Native Americans, and then, of course, the pioneers. And as people are learning more, not only do they like the flavor of maple syrup better, but they're finding out that it's better for them. We're seeing an increase in demand. And part of our job in industry is to market this to, to people so they understand what, what maple syrup is. So where does Wisconsin rank? First of all, you've got Canada, Quebec, making like five million, at least five million pounds. Although there was some kind of hoist, you remember reading about that, of, of maple syrup out of some, they didn't even know they were missing for a long time. Um, they got so much, they store it up in the tundra, in barrels, where basically the, the ground is frozen, right? So the keep, syrup keeps indefinitely up there. So when they have good years, they store extra syrup there. When the poor year, they bring it back out. So that they kind of act as a buffer, uh, which really helps keep the price of maple syrup more stable. Well, in the US, Vermont is first, of course. You know, they consider themselves the maple, don't they? Uh, then we have New York State, followed by Maine. And then, when we get past that, guess who comes up? <laughs> Fourth, I think that's where we rank in the football standings. <laughs> okay, so oops, jumped aside there. But um, after Wisconsin, we have Ohio, Michigan. There's a bunch of guys that wear purple to the west of us, and, and they're in that group too. So there's a lot of other states make New Hampshire. Uh, you know, so there's Michigan, there's a lot of states make maple syrup, but Wisconsin, and Wisconsin's probably one of the fastest growing states in terms of production. So, uh, you know, maybe we can knock out uh, Maine here, one of these places, uh, keep working at it. Okay, isn't that one advanced? Uh, I think, guys, fine guy. Oh, there we go. We're going to take you back in time. A long time ago, where the Native American tribes were the origin of maple sugar production in our state and in our nation, sugar maple trees were almost unlimited in the original forest, large maple trees, so they had a great resource for making the, the sap. There's many legends that exist in the native culture about maple syrup, and they used to treat it almost as a sacred item from the tree and from the earth. Um, the manufacture of sugar was one of the principal Native American industries. Uh, the Ojibwa up in the northern part of the state, we have the Menominee over in the east, uh, the Ho-Chunks, all them, all those tribes did a lot of maple. In, in the early days, of course, they didn't have metal buckets to collect sap in. They had to use birch bark vessels. They cooked it by putting hot stones in the 100-gallon birch bark tanks, I guess. I wonder how our state inspectors would think of that if I was doing that back in the woods, if I wouldn't like it so well. Um, but they, they didn't cook it to syrup, all the way to sugar. So we're talking here about maple sugar kind of production, because how would you store syrup? They put the sugar into little birch bark containers and buried them in the ground. For, uh, and they kept well for future use and for trade. There's my cardinal. <laughs> um, 
Along came the Europeans in the 1600s. I think one of the things that really advanced maple was the iron pot to cook the sap in. An observer reported that a band of 1,500 Menominee Indians made over 90 tons of this stuff. Can you believe it? <laughs> that was a major operation. 120 pounds of sugar per individual, often used in place of salt for seasoning, as well as for sweeteners, and it provided energy in lean times. Well, the first Europeans to really discover the use of maple syrup was our French voyageurs. And they found it was a great source of energy when they were doing portaging. They learned this from the, from the natives, and they you know, uh, began to produce maple sugar for that purpose as well. Then along come the American pioneers, which used maple syrup as their main source of sweeteners. Uh, Thomas Jefferson called it a free man sugar and considered it an important trade item potential for the U.S. He is quoted as saying, I will eat no sugar but maple sugar. <coughs> That's the way those folks worked, right? They, it was all or nothing. He started a maple grove in his Virginia plantation, but the weather wasn't very conductive there, so he never got the production he'd hoped for. Now, settlers moving west come to Wisconsin. They find this great resource of, of maple trees and things. And of course, they right away put that their use in making uh, syrup for trade and for their own consumptions. I think every little uh, uh, farm and, and uh, um, rural area had a maple bush. So it was a major source of the sugar. Cane sugar was very expensive or difficult to get. So they, they would use this for their sugar as well as trading. Uh, with the natives. Most of the sap still was cooked all the way to solid sugars, and even up until 1900, sugar was probably the major produce of the maple sap, not the syrup that we're used to today. Uh, it really, syrup started to take off as we had the advent of sealed jars. You could put the syrup in there and seal it, and it would keep. It was a source of sugars we mentioned for the pioneers. When I was out, uh, we did some biking on the Katy Trail this summer down in Missouri, and encountered a few different occurrences of Daniel Boone, which was really interesting to me that he spent the last 20 years of his life there. And I was reading up some on it, and he would make over 300 pounds of sugar each spring, actually a little sugar house he, that he cooked it in. And then he would go up the, up the Missouri on hunting trips, and he went all the way up to the Yellowstone, and he would use the sugar to trade with, with the natives uh, as he went, as well as for their own use. And as we mentioned, Thomas Jefferson looked at it as a potential um, for uh, U.S. trade. Well, let's take a look here at the source. As, as I skipped one sli slide there, which was just, you know, what is maple sap? And well, sap starts basically in the leaves. The leaf is the beginning of this whole process because the photosynthesis is taking that light energy along with the carbons and the waters and is, and is producing the carbohydrates. The maple tree is kind of unique in that it has little fibrous straw-like uh, porous uh, transfer material, that it, uh, fibers that can be used to transfer the water and the carbohydrates up and down the tree. So this process <clears throat> is happening throughout the summer. And I like to tell kids, when you, when you see that tree sitting out here, it's making maple sap. Um, it's, it's an amazing process. And then as we get towards fall, the process stops. The chlorophyll, that was the important piece of the green leaf that makes this possible, production is stopped and the natural color leaf is seen. So you have the beautiful reds and the yellows and the oranges. Of course, without the chlorophyll, the leaf dies, drops to the ground, the tree goes into dormancy, and uh, you know, conifers kind of wonder what's going on. So we go through the winter that way. And then, ah, spring. The sun's out, the day's longer, we feel the warmth, and, and um, things are starting to melt. And these fibers in the maple tree, because they're hollow, as we get that frost and the freezing and thawing, it, it generates uh, a vacuum. And these little microscopic straws then move the liquid up the tree, up to 100 feet up the tree through this process of the, the thawing and the expansion of those little fibers. This process is not totally understood, but they have a lot better handle on it than they used to. And you certainly notice that 
as a maple producer, how much difference that frost makes. So as this water moves up these fibers, it picks up the carbohydrates that were stored throughout the summer and, and, and moves them up into the tree, into the sapwood. <laughs> The sun activates little microbes and enzymes. These enzymes break these carbohydrates into sucrose sugar, essentially, and give off carbon dioxide. And these little microbes are typically active in a temperature range of around 35 to 40, maybe 45 degrees. If it gets warmer than that, they quit. They don't work when it's warm. They don't work when it's too cold. So they're picky. You know, they, they've got their job and they know what they need to do. So during the right temperature range then, <clears throat> this tree will be like a pop can with 20 pounds per square inch of pressure in there. So any break in the bark or a hole that we drill, the sap gets pushed out. If we don't get that, the right conditions, if it never gets the right temperature during the day or gets too warm or doesn't get warm enough or doesn't freeze at night and all those kind of things make a difference in whether we get a sap run. You can put a bicycle tire pressure pump in the, in the sap hole and check the pressure in the tree. And if it's like under 20, 15, 18 pounds, you won't have much sap run that day. But if it starts getting up there, then it, they'll take off. Here we see a little sap run, and, and the maple sap looks pretty much just like water. There's my cardinal. Uh, so you can see it's running pretty good there. They can run uh, 150 little drops uh, a minute without much trouble. And if this runs throughout the night, it'll fill your pail up. You know, you'll have a full pail of sap by the end of the day or end of the night. Of course, here we're poking a tube on it. This sap is, is really quite tasty. Uh, you know, I don't know if you want to drink a ton of it, it may have some other effects on you, but uh, <laughs> maybe get ready for a colonoscopy. Um, so, but because it has so many beneficial effects, it's really equated to, to like maple water, or excuse me, coconut water. And, and we're, we call this maple water after that. And I think one of the probably up and coming products, and I don't have it on the table here today, but is maple water. You may have anybody seen that in the store. Um, keep an eye peeled the next year or two as, as uh, right now we're in the process in the industry of, of setting up guidelines and standards so that maple water will, you know, what is maple water? We want to make sure everybody's labeling it the same. But so this is something I think you're going to start seeing in, in the near future because studies have shown that people prefer, it's much more palatable than like coconut water and contains many of the same healthful kinds of nutrients. So we'll see. Okay, how often then and when does sap runs occur? Well, really, sap can run any time there's no leaves or buds on the tree. You can have, we can have a sap run tomorrow. Uh, we can have it in January under certain thawing conditions or February. Uh, just about any month, but typically in those months you won't get much sap, and it's really not worth the effort to try to collect it and to tap your trees and so forth. Uh, under a really strange year, you might get a little sap run, but the best sap runs in Wisconsin occur in, in March into April. We're seeing these run a little bit earlier, the season's taking in, in, and I think if you looked at a study, which would be very interesting to get, it would find that we'd see the sap runs earlier now than we used to. I know my dad used to make most of the syrup in April. Now we're seeing most of it at the end of March. So in a good year, we should get three major sap runs. And these are separated by cold spells, typically. Maybe four or five days of cold weather, a snow. It's just people are, oh, not again, you know? But if you see a Joe with a smile on his face, probably the sap collector, because that's, <laughs> that means we're going to get a new sap run. And we like, typically, we have three of those if we have a good season. How much sap does it take to make a gallon of maple syrup? I think some of us were talking about that before the show today. And it can vary a lot. There was a researcher in Proctor called Professor uh, Jones back in 1903 developed what's called the Rule of 86. So if you take the sap test, how much percent sugar is in the sap divided in 86, you'll get how many gallons it's going to take to make a gallon of syrup. So if you have 2% sugar, you'll take 43 gallons. Typically, we, you know, hard maples will be 25 to 3%. Maybe sometimes, depending on the year, we may be down around two, you know, and again, soft maples will be some less. 
So if you had 3% sap, you're getting closer to 30, 35 gallons of sap per gallon of syrup. Can you make your own syrup? And has anybody made their own syrup? Anybody raise a hand? A couple of people have made your own syrup. Great. Um, you, need a, you just need a couple of maples in the yard and maybe some kind of a little tapping kit. And you can buy the tapping kits at Lady Farm Supply Store a lot of times, Fleet Farm, Farm and Fleet. Some of these places will have these little tapping kits. Often they come with a, a few little bags and some spouts that you can tap in and, and, and a drill bit. So with an electric drill and some of these spouts and a few bags, you're, you're ready to go. You're collecting sap. If nothing else, you could drink it, you know. But you probably want to cook it. I know one guy's collecting making wine with it and, and beer. You know, because he uses that as, as, in place of water in his wine and beer, and, and it's very, very tasty. So, a typical tree probably can get 10, 20 gallons of sap during the year. So, if you had a few, a few trees, you'd make yourself a gallon of syrup. Oops, got it carried away there. Uh, one way to cook it's in a turkey cooker, or a little flat pan over a fire. Uh, if you're doing that, though, it's better to. Take one batch of sap and cook it down until it gets close to the, you know, not so it doesn't burn, but you know, cook it down as far as you can, save it, take another batch, cook it down, then combine the two and cook them down to syrup. If you just keep adding fresh sap, what you're doing is recooking those sugar molecules over and over again, and you start losing some of the flavor. You could finish in the house, but be careful because if you get too much steam in the house, you know, you're you know, something will happen to your plaster or whatever. <laughs> and spouse may not like that. Um, you can use a candy thermometer. Take your, your sap up to 7.5 degrees above the boiling point of water. So it's around 219, 220 degrees. You should be able to then take it off and, and put it in a bottle and seal it. If you do that when it's good and hot, it'll keep uh, indefinitely. So what I want to do next is talk about some of the steps. So you can do this yourself, or you can have somebody else do it and, and appreciate their efforts. But there's really four steps in the process. It starts with tapping the trees. Now, this means you've got to find the right trees to tap. And our little fellow here on the left somehow wasn't looking up and tapped telephone poles. Didn't get anything out of them. And I've, this is kind of dumb, but I've done this in the woods. Go tap this tree. You know, I'm tapping and then come back. She says, no top on that tree, the thing's dead. You know, no wonder it didn't run any sap, you know? So anyway, look at your tree tops, make sure it's a healthy tree, find good wood, um, rotate the tap holes, and you'll get used to identifying maple trees that they kind of all look the same when you st started, but later you find that they, uh, they're, you know, you recognize them easily. Usually we put one tap in, but if it's a big tree over 15 inches, you could probably put a couple taps in it. Um, when would you tap? We mentioned probably early, mid-March. Depends on your location, and each year can be a little bit different. This last year, we sort of missed some of the boat because we should have tapped in February up there in Rice Lake area. But we typically don't have any luck tapping in February, so we decided to wait till March. And we missed the first sap run. So you want to make sure you get good wood. Good wood is big. We, you know, if you tap an old tap hole or something, you're not going to get much. Rotate the tap holes around the tree. Even though it's typically good to tap, a lot of people like to tap on the south, the east side of the tree because it warms up quicker in the spring. But studies have shown it doesn't really matter. But the main thing that matters is having a good tap, a good solid wood. And electric drills. God, has that been a lifesaver? You know, I can barely remember the old brace and bit. My grandfather used it and my dad. Then we got a, a chainsaw with a drill in the end. You had to lug this thing around. You know, and now, of course, electric drills, a couple of batteries, you just get it done quick. The spiles have changed from big 7 16 inch large spiles. I've got some up here you can come look at later. Uh, the 5 16 today is very common, and they make little bitty 1 8 inch tap um, spiles that you can put in small trees. So you can tap today a small tree with, by just drilling a small hole in it. You know, you don't have to put a great big old hole in there. We've also found that. One of the things that really ages a sap hole is when you tap a, uh, a, put a spout in there that's, that's not clean, because all kinds of little microbes and stuff on there, and those grow in the sap, and they close the hole up. New spiles can increase 10%, so a lot of people are buying new plastic spiles every year and increasing production. 
We mentioned rotating the tap holes. Uh, here you can see the tap. We have a slight angle, and, and when you tap that uh, spiral, you want to be careful. Don't give it a big whack. You'll crack the wood. Tap, 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 tap. You know, get it in nice and gentle. Make sure it's in solid. It'll fall out. And that's disappointing to have your bucket on the ground. OK, we've got our trees tapped. We're ready to collect. And depends on your collection what you, how you tapped them. In the old days, you had one choice, the size of your sap bucket. A lot of people had little one gallon, 10 quart buckets. Of course, they run over right away and you lose a lot of sap. So trees can run three to four gallons of sap in just a, several hours. So you want to make sure you have a large enough bucket or you're right on top of it to collect it when, it when it fills up. The collection of buckets is rather labor intensive, going around picking these things up and lugging around through the deep snow. It, it's uh, not for us older guys. Also with buckets, you got to take them out, then the covers out pick them up, wash them, it's a lot of overhead. They say one man can gather 500 um, buckets a day. So some of these operations have eight or 10,000 trees. Think of the team you'd have to have out there to collect all that. So buckets are good if you have small operations. The other problem with buckets is you have to get into the woods with equipment. Four-wheelers, tractors, something and that compresses the soil. Bags. They're easier to take out. You can put a whole sled full in there and, and, and take them out. My um, brother's kind of ingenious, and he, he, he drilled a hole in these, little, in these uh, PVC pipes and then put a bag on with a, with a, with a hose clamp. And these work pretty slick. And bags only cost a few 10, 15 cents, 20 cents a piece. The problem is dumping the bags can be a little tricky because you've got this big gelatinous bag and you're trying to put it into your pail and easy to spill it. So along came sap tubing. Advantages, reduces labor in collecting the sap, increases the sap flow, especially if you put a vacuum on it, you can suck the sap out of the buggers. By gosh, we're gonna get our sap, one way or the other. And uh, if the tree can't generate enough pressure, then I'll suck it out by creating a vacuum on the sap hole. It's much faster to tap these trees because you got the, the spile and everything sitting right there. You come up, put the thing in, tap, walk to the next one, same thing, and you don't, you don't have to worry about filling your maples, right? Because the sap lines are running right by the maples. You can get people that don't know a maple from an oak, and they can still drill a hole in there and put the tap hole in. Just make sure they don't goof the tree up by drilling too deep, or you know, they, they should know what they're doing. Um, the disadvantages is, of course, the cost of setting up this tubing system. More difficult to move around the woods. You've got to be on top of tubings. There's things called squirrels out there, rodents, <laughs> bears, all kind of stuff. Deer, they knock it down, limbs fall on it. You've got to be out walking your tubing lines. There's two types of tubing systems we see today. The one you see in the picture here is our conventional ones. It has main lines that um, we run the main line through the wood. It's this thicker pipe. And then we connect onto the main line the laterals. And then the lateral runs up. We can cook maybe seven or eight trees onto the lateral line. Quite a bit of setup to get this all together. But once you've got it, you're a happy guy. Um, bears are <laughs> big troubles. They, we've had them chew, uh, chew holes in main lines. They decide to suck the sap out. They, they tend to round up the laterals and put them in piles, and I don't know what they're up to. I guess they got nothing better to do. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> they're working in the woods. <clears throat> A new type of tap, this is, per, this is kind of recent development, it's much thinner line, it's called 3 16 and we don't, you don't use main line with this, you just run this down the hill. You can run up to 30 or 40 trees onto one of these, and because it's thin, as the sap comes in here, it creates vacuum by the hill. You can get over 20 inches of vacuum at the top of a 50, 60 foot hill just by the, by the weight of the sap. You don't need to put in vacuum pumps and things, and this is great for small operations that have hills and, you know, and trees they want to tap that way. If you want to, you could take all that down, especially if you had a small operation, you wouldn't have to leave it up all year. We can create hybrids. Here's one. We got 16, 3 sixteenths in this woods here, running down the hill and getting around 20 inches of vacuum. <clears throat> Okay, however we did it, we've got sap at the cookhouse. We either lugged it in, 
pumped it in, it ran in, and somehow it got here and it's sitting in a tank by our cooker. Now we're going to make our syrup. And let's take a look at this process. Conventionally, what we did was boil the hell out of it. Just boil, cook, and cook, and cook. The bigger your cooker, the better. But we're, we're, in our sugar bush, we have two 16 foot long by 5 foot wide evaporators. They burn wood like you wouldn't believe. You think you're running a steam engine. And here I am stoking up one of those evaporators, cooking both, both rigs. But you burn a lot of wood, and you know, you, you, you don't get as much syrup at the end of the day as we'd like. Um, so there's many changes in the process. Let's take a look at some different um, operation here. What's going on with this guy? Come on. Wake up. Oh, there we go. He went like mad. Here's a little, you can buy a little bit of evaporator like this. I was talking to one of the producers up here at Kadat. He said, you're amazed at how much the hobby market is growing. So people cook their sap instead of a turkey cooker. Here's a big evaporator. It's called continuous flow because you see the sap comes in the back. And there's little flues that drop into that, into that firebox, which really increases the surface area. And the sap starts in the back and just kind of works its way forward as new sap comes in, so that by the time you get over to the other edge, you've got a very rich, almost maple syrup. And we'll usually check the temperature. When it gets up to the right temperature, we'll draw it off. Some of the changes that have been going on with the evaporators, uh, fuel oil is one of the first big changes. People start using fuel oil instead of wood. Of course, that's kind of expensive, but then again, it costs time and money to make firewood. So. It really isn't as bad as it may seem. Um, better efficient flue pans, steam aways. Like, look at this rig down here. <laughs> it's got big steam away pans, so the steam comes up and it actually reheats and boils sap so that we get the most out of our wood calories. But probably the biggest thing today is this guy, reverse osmosis. Raw sap is pumped under high pressure into a membrane. And then the water molecules go through the membrane, but not the sugar and minerals and those kind of things stay out. So we concentrate the sap by squeezing the water out of it. ROs can take over 80% of the water out of your sap. Uh, and you can get from 3% sugar to like 18% sugar coming into your evaporator on some of the newer ROs. And there's many different sizes. There's little hobby ROs for people that maybe have 100 or 200 taps, and there's gigantic ones of people that have 10,000 taps. One of the things that we see changing is, is how the ratio between the evaporator size and the RO size. Today, it pays to have a great big RO take most of the water out and a small evaporator to cook it enough to get the flavor and the color, and, and then you can process it. One of the researches that we're, what we're studying is how does this high concentrate sap affect the flavor of maple syrup? Are we getting some of the same flavors from the syrup that we did when we cooked it right from scratch? And, um, you know, I think some people are on both sides of the fence here. And, and so anyway, that's something that the industry is concerned about and, and studying. How do we know when the syrup's done? Well, you can use a thermometer, about 220 degrees, and I'm using kind of what we have at our elevation and stuff. This will change depending on atmospheric pressure and, and again, how high you are where you're cooking, which, of course, is, affects the atmospheric pressure, doesn't it? Uh, if you want to go all the way to sugar, take it at 241 on your candy thermometer. Then take it out. Once it gets to 241 degrees, you can beat it, get, get the crystals to form, pour it out into molds or onto a dish. So if you want to make your own maple sugar at home, just take a cup of maple syrup in a little pan and cook it up to that 241 degrees and, and stir it up and you'll be able to pour it out and make maple sugar. Hygrometer, as we've got right here, it's a little hygrometer. You also use this if you're making beer maybe. And you, and you put your sap in, in your little bed and you, and you float it in there and, and when it comes to the, to the red line where it's maple syrup, you know it's done. 
You've got to make sure it's hot. It should be boiling hot because if it's cooler, it'll be denser and it'll float higher. So you got to make sure you're sampling the hot, like I'm right here, sampling the syrup out of the syrup pan and checking to make sure that we have the right <coughs> uh, density. A more high tech is using a refractometer. You have to calibrate it for your temperature, but then it, you know, is a good way to test your sugar percent. It'll tell you. And once you get to 66% sugar, it's technically maple syrup. We like to go a little bit further, makes it a little thicker and a little uh, better, we feel. But if you go too much, it'll crystallize. You'll get little sugar crystals on the bottom of your bottles. Now, if you know maple syrup, there's no problem. But people don't say, what's happened to my maple syrup? There's little crystals growing on it. They think it's something bad. But it's just that it's overly cooked a little bit, a little bit too sweet. OK, fourth step, filter and bottle. Here we see a filter press. And in the background, you see the finishing pan. We take it off the evaporator by temperature. We put it in the finishing pan and cook it to the exact density we want. We pump it through a filter press, take out all the sediments, probably all the good stuff. And then we put it into a nice stainless steel barrel like the boys are doing down there. Those guys are all sap gatherers hoping for a sample. <laughs> then we should grade the syrup. And Wisconsin is really encouraging. We, as an, as an association, would like to require people to grade their syrup. So when you buy it on the store shelf, you know whether or not you're buying the same syrup you did, you know, last time you bought it. Um, you can usually tell if it's in glass, if it's dark or lighter. But even then, it doesn't tell you the flavor sometimes. So you should grade the syrup, make sure it's labeled. We put it into a bottling machine. If you're a small operator, you probably have a little bottling machine like that. You heat it up to 190 degrees. You keep it real close line of temperature because if it drops below 180 and you fill your bottle, it may not, it may get some uh, mold spores in there and it'll mold on you. And so you don't, you know, you want to keep the temperature up there. If you seal that syrup in a bottle at around 108, 190 degrees, you get keep for years. I mean, there's no issues with that. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, in Wisconsin, we tend to use more glass for bottling our syrup, but a lot of states put more into plastic. And I, I am a little concerned about long-term storage of, of syrup and plastic. We think it darkens a little bit, but um, you know, studies are still being done. OK, now let's get some money. We made this syrup. We've been out here working. How are we going to sell it? What are selling options? What are the regulations? And what are some common products? Well, one selling option is to take those barrels you made and take it off to the bulk syrup buyers. Another one is to sell direct from your farm, farm stand, or maybe sell it online or optionally through a store. But if you're going to sell through stores, you need a license. That means you need to have an inspection, get a SAP, a syrup license before you can sell it in stores. You can sell limited amount of bulk syrup to the packers. Now, these aren't Green Bay guys because they don't buy certain barrels. They buy beer in barrels. <laughs> anyway, so you sell it to a packer. A packer is a person who basically bottles maple syrup and distributes it. We have some large packers in our state, and uh, we, you can find out packers that are around you by, by checking our website. Here are some of our standard products, and I've got those on the table here. We've got the syrup in, in nice gift bottles for this time of year, These different kinds of syrup we'll talk about. Uh, then there's the maple cream or spread. You can open that later. And then, of course, your sugar candies and all that good stuff. There's some special products. We've got maple mustard, barbecue sauce, cotton candy. I got maple root beer up here. We've got flavored syrups, cherries, cranberries, apples, who knows, what, cinnamon sticks in it. You guys are trying all kinds of stuff. Organic maple syrup is catching on. More and more um, producers, you have to go through kind of a, um, a complex process to get certified organic. I mean, all syrup's organic, but this way you just get certified. And if you're shipping syrup into cities and things where people don't understand the process, maybe that's a good thing. Then one of the ones that's really catching on a little bit on the side market is taking your old bourbon barrels um, that have been aged bourbon for 25 years in this barrel. Nice oak has been fired. And you drain the barrel. Oh, and then you put your maple syrup in there. Let it age for three or four months and then bottle it. Got a really nice flavor. No alcohol, so it isn't like you're going to buzz all this, but it's just really nice um, flavor syrup. Um, a lot of things happening in the, in the market. I mentioned that uh, earlier that <clears throat> maple is replacing uh, pumpkin spice. 
And I have evidence of that because I have some Jelly Belly maple beans. <laughs> so there, you guys can try some if you want later. Um, alcoholic beverages, they, well by the way, non-alcoholic beverages are up 85% with maple flavoring, like the maple root beer there. Um, then you have the, the alcoholic, like maple infused whiskeys, maple inf infused vodkas, the grown one. Uh, Microbrews are starting to use maple for, for making beers, and, and, and I've got a nice bottle of maple wine um, that, that's made. So there's a lot of different specialty products. And we mentioned maple water coming. That may be really a big product if that takes off, uh, like it has the potential to. Canada's been doing a lot of work in marketing maple syrup overseas in Europe and Asia. So, and those markets are, are, are growing. What are some concerns for the future? Climate change. This is change, this, the maple belt's moving north further. We're not sure how climate change, how fast it happens, how the maple industry may be affected. Um, but, but it is, what we're noticing our seasons are, are more random. We'll have a really good season, and then we'll have a bad one, really bad one. And, and then you'll have the season happening early, like in February, and the trees aren't even hardly ready to run yet, and the war weather warmed up. Um, vacuum pumps, vacuum systems, and tubing systems like this are helping a lot because you don't need the perfect weather to get a good sap run. So the big producers that are sapling several thousand trees, they can't afford to have half a crop. You know, they'll they go broke. So with high vacuum, getting over 20 inches of vacuum on the vacu sap lines, it really makes a difference on bad seasons. If it's a good season, the gravity guy is going to make about the same as the vacuum person. But the good seasons happen about once in three or four years. So the vacuum guys can get pretty consistent seasons every year. It doesn't really take a lot more sap out of the tree. And the biggest change we've noticed in some of the research is that the surplus sap of the maple tends to be used for seed production. So the maple seem to do pretty good with seeds, so probably not hurting them too badly. Another big thing is invasive insects. I think the long-horned Asian beetle is the biggest threat that the maple producers encountered in recent history. And it started out in Massachusetts, I think, and it's, it, they've been able to keep it pretty well contained. The good thing about it is that when, the, when these long-horned uh, long Asian beetles deal with holes in trees and lay their eggs in the young, they pretty much stay in that tree until the tree starts to die. Then they move. And they don't move long distances. So we can see that a maple tree is infected. We can get rid of that tree, get rid of the Asian beetles. So if we're on top of our woods, which one thing about maple producers, they're out in the woods a lot. They see if their trees aren't looking good, something's happening. So uh, I think we're so far hoping to keep that contained, but who knows what's next. Another thing is regulations. Regulations are, well, to its sort, they're good, but if we over-regulate an industry, we can also uh, cause uh, that industry for that state to be less competitive. So we're in our Maple Association working with the State Agricultural Department to make sure the regulations make sense. Like for example, this last year they thought the evaporator should be cleaned after every cooking. What, did I hear that? What, please tell me that again, eh? Uh, no, no, you, you, you couldn't clean that great big rig after every cooking. You, you know, you'd go broke. You know, it would cost you all your time. So there's no need to. So anyway, we, we've, uh, we're the same with reverse osmosis, the regulations for using that equipment. And we need to work with the state, so you know, they want to do good, and so do we. And education is a lot of that. And that's where our association becomes so important to the industry. Uh, Wisconsin Maple Syrup Organization promotes maple syrup production, marketing throughout the state. Our members are all size of producers. We have very large producers, several thousand, 10,000 taps, and a lot of producers only with 120 taps. But they, you know, it's funny, some of the people that know the most about maple are the hobbyists and the people with a small number of taps, you know? They, they are really on top because that's their passion. It's their hobby, it's their interest. We hold annual meetings and conferences. We are hosted the International Convention in Green Bay in 2006, and we'll be hosting one in La Crosse in 2020. So we'll have producers from all across the U.S. and Canada uh, here to learn about Wisconsin and our maple syrup and, and how things are in this part of the country. Uh, we work with national organizations. We let people be a voice to state government. People say, well, nobody listens to me. Well, be part of our association because as a group, we can get attention and we can work through problems. 
one of the things that we were big on is getting property tax reliefs. And we're the only, I think it's only two states in the country where if you tap maple trees, not just one or two, but a, a reasonable number, your property can be, be can treated as forest egg, and you get a lot less tax. And, and this has caused a lot of uh, people who are landowners to say to the maple producer down the road, hey, come on over here and tap my trees, would you? <laughs> because then I can get a tax break. We're doing a lot of promotion for the public. We have a, a fall tour, which is open to the public. We did it over in southwestern Wisconsin this year. We had like 100 people. We went around a couple of maple productions. We went to a microbrewery. Uh, we had a, a good time there. We, and, then we, and we saw other businesses, cheese factories and things. So we learn about local industry as well as maple production. We do SERP judging in May. People can bring their samples in. And if their SERP is judged blue ribbon, then they are able to bid the SERP through our state fair booth. So they can, if you come down to Milwaukee, stop by at our state fair booth and see what we've got. We maintain websites and work to get grants for education. We're working right now to, so that teachers can get packets for their school so they can you know, show the kids how to tap trees and make some maple syrup. And we're exploring new marketing methods. One of the things we're looking at is some billboards around the state. You know, um, We have, um, and we'll show you, we've got a lot of publications, uh, maps that show all the, all the producers in the state, which we're putting online, um, booklets, like the beginner's guide to how to make syrup, I've got these here for you if you'd like one tonight. Um, so we, we do a lot, of, a lot of things to kind of promote maple. Here's our website, wismaple.org. Go out there and you'll learn a lot about maple as well as our, our events and things that are happening around the state. How about sustainability? One of the things that we want to talk just briefly about. Um, We've had trees in Vermont and other places tap for over 100 years that show no adverse effect. We've decreased the size of tap holes. It used to be like uh, 7 sixteenths. Now we're down to 5 or even less. Because with vacuum, we don't need a great big hole. We can suck this much tap out of a small hole. And so smaller holes for smaller trees. Vacuum enhances it without the need. I mean, like say the natives used to cut a big notch in the buggers and then put a stick out to run the sap off. Here's, a, here's an interesting picture of a, of a tree that's been tapped for many years. Sometimes people in, in the logging industry don't like sap producers because they say, well, you're ruining my butt logs. Well, they found out that people pay a lot more for trees that have this kind of a neat pattern in it. So now, come on in, tap my trees. Um, maple forest sustainability. Uh, one of the best things about maple is that people take good care of their trees. We're out there, you know, we want our trees to be healthy and strong and, and growing well, looking for insects and other kind of problems. Typically, you can get 60 or 80 taps an acre. And uh, forest diversity. We, we don't want a pure maple forest. We want to have ash and oak in there, too, and other varieties, because that creates a healthier forest. Here's a few references that, that I used during the, pro the program. There's a neat book called Sweet Maple. Google that one, that's really an interesting book. North American Syrup Producers Manual, which is done by the Ohio State University Extension, is, is very complete and a lot of research in there. There's a neat little booklet on making maple syrup in the USA since 1650, which I used to get some of the information on the natives and some of the early settlers. Of course, that Time Magazine article, and how much can we learn by Googling, eh? You know, a lot of my pictures and stuff come by Googling different sites. Some of the product donations you see here today come from Roth Sugar Bush up in Kadat, Anderson Maple Syrup up by Cumberland. I got some stuff from our Sugar Bush. Volsa's provided the maple cream and, and some other stuff. And of course, Wisconsin Maple Syrup producers provided me with lots of materials. We'll take a look for questions. But one last thing I want to end with, because this is kind of interesting technology called plantation maple. In Proctor, Vermont, they're saying, what, how could we maybe utilize some of this uh, land, which is no longer productive agriculturally, by growing trees? Well, it takes like <clears throat> 30 to 50 years for maple tree to get big enough to tap it conventionally. So what Dr. Tim Perkins has done it, and his assistants is they put maple saplings in rows. They run a wire along there like, a, like, a, like you would in a vineyard. And there's a sap tubing line along there with a, with a vacuum pump. They cut off a chunk of the tree, as you can see here, and they put a little sap sack on it and suck the sap out. 
And research has shown that they've been able to get more sap per acre through this method than conventionally big trees. It doesn't kill that little shrub, it just grows out. And then you cut another piece off and it, you know, and you, and you trim it just like you do a, <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a vineyard. So who knows? They're doing research on this to see if it's really gonna be a feasible method. One nice thing about it is these little trees do not need quite the weather. They can grow in a wider range of climate. They're not as affected by insects and things, so he sees it as a potential way to kind of help um, the industry as, as we go through <clears throat> some of these challenges. Okay, well, um, what I want to do now is kind of just kind of wrap up, see if you guys have some questions, and uh, hopefully, you know, you have a lot better idea today as, as to the story of Maple in Wisconsin and, and where it's going, what we're doing, and, and it's just wonderful to have uh, such a nice crowd here, and we hope that um, this has been a uh, you know, worthwhile presentation to you. Please feel free afterwards, we'll come questions and, and take a look at some of the products. Thank you.